Okay, so I'll be kicking off the uh, first session this afternoon on energy generation, uh, and Claire Savage uh, will uh, be following me for the next presentation, so we'll leave our question and answer session until both Claire and I have finished. Uh, and it's uh, my role uh, to follow on from Margaret's talk to give you a little bit of um, background on the current state of play and maybe then take a, a forward look into uh, where the energy generation sector will be uh, in, uh, in the longer term. And Claire will then talk a little bit more about the key short term issues and uh, particularly industry uh, concerns and issues that uh, might arise from the green paper process. So let me just start first of all with a quick summary of Australia's energy production. And this is uh, again from the Bureau for Resource and Energy Economics data in 2012. And what it shows is that Australia is a major energy exporter. We do consume energy of course ourselves but we export a lot more energy than we use. And uh, this, of course, is primarily in uh, fossil fuels, pr principally uh, black coal, but also uh, natural gas and, uh, and other fossil fuel products. Uh, but it's uh, important to note that we export around about a third, uh, or slightly more than a third, of the energy in uranium oxide as we do in black coal. So this is a significant uh, component to our export profile. And then if we come over here to our domestic uh, consumption, what we find is that, uh, again, we are uh, very strongly uh, reliant on particularly uh, coal and uh, gas and uh, other uh, fossil fuel products for our public electricity uh, and uh, other sector energy transformations. In fact, if you look at electricity alone, we rely on gas and coal for 90% of our generation. And then this uh, shows how that is consumed by various sectors. Some are more energy intensive than others. Uh, but the uh, bottom line is that uh, we consume a considerable amount uh, of our own domestic uh, fuel and we do import, of, as has already been mentioned, uh, a significant proportion, a dominant proportion of our liquid transport fuels. So that's uh, the current status. The next picture is a, uh, a, a set of recent data. This comes from uh, Pitt and Sherry, uh, their uh, monthly CDEX report on electricity generation. And what this shows us is that uh, over the last uh, decade or so, there's been a peak in electricity demand, which has declined since around about uh, 2008 in a uh, fairly inexorable fashion. And Margaret has already alluded to some of the reasons why this is. Uh, it's structural changes in the economy. It's the global financial crisis. It's the shift away from energy intensive manufacturing. Uh, but it's also uh, a result of changes in behavior. Uh, it is a result of people using higher efficiency equipment, whether it's domestically or commercially. It's a result of people using less electricity in total. And it also, uh, hides uh, the fact that there is behind the meter generation, uh, which is people with rooftop photovoltaics, which is not included in this total, uh, but which nonetheless replaces electricity generated uh, through the national electricity market. And the bottom part of the figure shows uh, what is happening in terms of the transformation of the electricity generation sector. So what we are seeing in uh, the same time frame is a significant uh, decrease in the generation from black and brown coal. Uh, although you can see there's a slight upturn in very recent times, which may or may not be correlated with the change in the carbon price. Uh, and there has been, of course, uh, a long period of coming out of drought where hydro has started to pick up its output uh, in more recent years. And we see a rise in the generation due to renewables uh, including primarily wind, but also other sources, and, uh, and also over this time frame, a rise in the generating due to gas. So what we see here uh, are two effects. One is the decrease in demand for electricity, and two is the change in the mix of electricity being generated from various sources. So one of the things that uh, the white paper will need to uh, uh, include in its discussion is how will this uh, mix uh, look in the future? Uh, 
what uh, barriers are in place that might affect the mix, the freely evolving uh, mix uh, that the market uh, may determine? Are there reasons for doing anything other than let the market determine that mix? And indeed, what is going to happen if this uh, inexorable decline in electricity demand continues and uh, what will that mean for the business model of generators who are at the moment uh, changing their mix of source. So the Bureau for Resource and Energy Economics uh, a number of years ago uh, started the Australian Energy Technology Assessment Exercise, AETA. I was a member of the uh, steering committee for the AETA uh, project and uh, we looked at a range of technologies, 40 technologies in total, uh, many of which are current technologies but uh, with various improvements, particularly in the way of uh, fossil fuels. And the uh, way that this uh, evaluation was done was to determine the levelised cost of electricity. In other words, the cost uh, of generating electricity which takes into account not just fuel costs and maintenance costs of plant, but also the investment in the plant amortised over the lifetime of the plant, etc. And uh, this uh, is a snapshot in 2020 of the technology costs uh, in terms of the number of dollars per megawatt hour. So 100 on this scale is a good number. And it shows where the technologies stack up uh, in terms of their levelised cost of electricity. And the error bars here indicate the uncertainty in these estimates. And what we see is that uh, by 2020, and certainly um, uh, this is, remember, without a carbon price included, that uh, onshore wind is a very strong competitor here with a range of, uh, of different fossil fuel technologies, including uh, combined cycle gas turbine. Uh, that solar PV is starting to come into the mix, although it has very large error bars because of the uncertainty in the price into the future. And indeed, uh, nuclear, uh, both large scale and small scale modular reactors, uh, is starting to uh, come into the mix at that point as well. So there is a diversity of choice here and uh, what we see is an evolution over time because of technological change. If we now go to 2050, you can see the result of this technological change because solar photovoltaics have now become the cheapest form uh, and that's a result of the very rapid learning rate that we've seen in recent years for PV. Uh, wind, of course, and gas are still somewhere in the mix there. Nuclear is, is not far behind. But again, this is a long way ahead, so the uncertainties are, are quite significant in this, in this estimate. But what it does show you is that the, over the very long term, there will be changes. Over this time frame, all the existing plant will be retired uh, at some stage in the, in the coming uh, three and a half decades. And so the question is, what will replace that plant at some point? Assuming, of course, that electricity demand doesn't go to zero, uh, there will be a need to replace that plant. So uh, the best guess in the future, and this is just my personal guess, is that uh, we will be witnessing a massive energy change and this to a large extent will be driven by the requirements to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that wind will be joined by large scale photovoltaics a few decades hence uh, as the most competitive renewable. Uh, that nuclear will continue to be a viable uh, option for thermal power generation and that coal may be replaced by gas, depending as we've just already heard uh, in the discussion with Margaret on the, on the gas price, whether the gas price goes up or perhaps if the US enters uh, the international market, it goes the other way. Um, but then, of course, in the long term, uh, we, uh, we saw on the uh, projections for AETA that, uh, that the renewables will come into the picture and that nuclear is also an option. And I would add that carbon capture and storage is unlikely to be an option, and we can discuss that later. The one thing that I would say about the uh, AETA uh, predictions is that uh, this is for plug and play. So you remove a particular generating source at the end of its life, you replace it with something else in the same place. Now that's not always the case for renewables because renewables, uh, for example, the geothermal sources that Margaret mentioned are often in remote locations. So you need to factor in the network costs and add that to the LCOE. So irrespective of that, you can see the long-term trends that there will be an increasing uh, viability for a lot of these renewables and they will certainly be in the mix. And then finally, we need to establish what will be the future of the grid. So some of the key issues that I see uh, uh, coming into the green paper process is that uh, we have witnessed over the last uh, decade or so at both state and federal level uh, enormous change in, in energy policy. 
and this shows no sign of abating. Uh, we've seen uh, changes on carbon pricing. Uh, we've looked uh, recently at uh, renewing the, uh, reviewing the RET. Uh, there have been massive changes in feed-in tariffs uh, in the states, etc., etc., etc. And all these changes threaten industry investment because it drives uncertainty, and uncertainty is then reflected in increased risk, and increased risk is reflected in increased pricing. So something needs to change if we are to provide industry with a long-term planning capability that it needs over these decade-long timescales in order to uh, advance uh, the energy investment sector. Uh, as has already been mentioned, uh, all options need to be on the table, uh, so we need to establish uh, the uh, availability of all sources, and this includes nuclear, in order to move this, uh, this particular program of reinvesting in our generating capacity forward. We need to look at community acceptance uh, and to educate NIMBYism. Australia, uh, of course, has a very big backyard and everyone wants to keep it exactly as it is. So uh, we need to uh, look at this, and this is a, 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 an issue that uh, applies across the board, whether it's solar, whether it's wind, whether it's nuclear, whether it's fossil fuels. Uh, nobody seems to want to be able to uh, host a, a power source in their immediate location. So this is an important thing that needs addressing across the board, irrespective of what our future lies. And then finally, we need to establish uh, what is going to be the future of the electricity grid with this decreasing uh, electricity demand curve that we've seen with an increase in disseminated generation of electricity from behind the meter and uh, how this is going to feed into issues of social equity uh, where perhaps people with uh, low incomes who are least uh, uh, able to afford it are left bearing the cost of the national electricity grid. So those are the issues uh, as I see it and thank you for your attention. So let me now introduce Claire Savage and Claire uh, will now tell us her view of, uh, of the energy generation story from an industry perspective. And that's the slight advancer. Uh, backwards and forwards, yep. Now I've got a very angry eardrum after my flight this morning, so if you're gonna ask a question, can I ask you to speak up? And if you can't hear me, tell me, because Agenda. I feel like I'm 10 feet about. underwater and I'm shouting at everybody. Um, it's been a long time since I've heard anyone talk about LCOE, which is of course a levelised cost of energy. So it's quite refreshing, Ken, because we used to talk about it all the time. And one of the reasons we don't talk about it very much anymore um, is, is what I want to talk about today. But I want to start with a couple of questions that I asked last time I was here at the ANU, just more for my own edification than anything else. Hands up if you've got solar panels. Yes, it's probably about half the room. Hands up if you've got LED lighting. Yep, this is why we don't talk about the levelised cost of energy anymore, because we're not really looking for new investment in any time soon. When you look at what's happened to demand uh, in Australia for electricity, it has fallen since 2008. I uh, can say that it probably took us till about 2011 as an industry to work that out, which is remarkably slow. Um, the reasons for electricity demand falling, I like to break it into a few buckets. So half of the fall in demand has come from um, CNI, so commercial industrial closures, like the closure of the Curry Curry smelter in New South Wales or Blue Scope um, steel, steel in New South Wales as well. The other half has come from changes in the residential sector. And so I break that other half into three buckets. One of them is demand elasticity, so the fact that actually, you know, when prices go up, people do use less. Um, that's also something that people didn't really believe happened in electricity for some reason. Um, the introduction of more uh, decentralised generation, so that's solar um, and in some other forms of embedded generation and then energy efficiency. So just the fact that we've got things like LED and, and technologies which are helping us to reduce our household consumption. Even if you just look at LED, for example, the number of people who put their hands up in this room about having LED, the original incandescent light bulbs were, the, an LED light is 80% more efficient than an incandescent light bulb. 
And, and lighting was traditionally about half of everybody's electricity use at the household sector. So you can see these kinds of changes are having quite a big change to the way in which demand has, has, um, has occurred in recent years. But if you look at this chart up here, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, if you look up here, this is the latest version of the um, NEFA. So this is the Australian Energy Market operate, uh, Operator's forecast of demand. And this is the first time we've seen a forecast from them that looks something like, I guess, what our internal forecasts look like. And what they're basically saying is that they see demand is essentially going to be flat. So there's a bit of growth there, which comes from the LNG sector. Let me see if I can use a little... How do I make it with the light come out of it? Uh, That's too much, isn't it? Uh, yeah, the green one? Oh, I went forward. Yeah, there we go. So that wedge there, if you take that black line at the top, that would be demand growth, small amount of demand growth in the sector, which comes really from LNG. Because if you extract the LNG amount, you have this dotted line, and that's flat. So you actually see falling demand until about 2016-17, and then flat underlying demand out to 2020. So the Australian Energy Market Operator has been pretty clear in saying there's no new need for new investment in our sector until at least the 2020s. You can see that in this chart as well. Um, the electricity market is massively oversupplied at the moment. Um, I've got some shareholders who wish that wasn't the case, but this is average demand in the NEM at the bottom. This is the um, generation, and then this is what we would call the reserve margin. So you can see at the moment reserve margins are up at around the 65% level, which means we've got a lot more generation than what we have demand for it. So capacity factors have also fallen. We've seen that in Ken's slides as well. So when you look at baseload plant, which is black coal and brown coal, you can see the steep downturn for the red line, which is brown coal, over the, since the introduction of the carbon price. You would expect that to come back a little bit now with the carbon price being removed. Um, and black coal fell sharply during the years of the... Uh, oh, sorry, flattened a little bit, but you expect that to come back a little bit as well, but not as quickly as brown coal. As you'd expect, when you have, um, obviously, a lot more supply than you have demand, household, wholesale prices have dropped dramatically. Now, there's a lot of talk about the RET having, and the introduction of renewables having suppressed prices. It does have some impact on price, but excess supply um, and demand is really what drives a lot of weak, um, weak prices in the market. So the two charts that you see there are energy prices. I don't actually have capacity prices on this, on this chart. But what you can see here is that you know, at the time of the drought in the, about 2008, before demand started to fall, prices were up at sort of $60, $65 a megawatt hour. Now, towards the start of this year, we started to see them really around the $20 to $25 mark, which is getting to a point which is not much more than the short-run marginal cost of, of plant. The forward prices have got some lift in them, particularly in New South Wales, and some of that's around assumptions around further plant closures going forward. But the story really is around the fact that we've seen this weak wholesale outlook. We've seen prices really low, unsustainably low in my view, but retail prices have actually increased rapidly. And a lot of that's been around the cost of networks, and there's been some talk about green schemes as well, but the cost of the carbon tax or the cost of the renewable energy target is dwarfed in the context of the cost of um, what's happened in networks. So the natural thing that people are going to look to is how do you avoid a network cost? And what one way of doing that, of course, is to actually self-supply, or as um, Ken referred to it, as installing generation behind the meter. So the biggest subsidy that sits out there for solar PV at the moment, it's not the renewable energy target, it's the fact that solar actually avoids the cost of the network. And that has implications. It can be regressive, um, because from the perspective of households who can afford solar, and no disrespect to this group here, because obviously most of you can afford solar, but there are some households who can't, and they're left actually carrying a share of that network cost. But in my view, the advancements that we'll see, we've sort of started down this path now. So solar and battery storage technology mean that grid defection is actually a really real prospect. Um, if you will actually see households kind of go into one of these four categories as we consider it. The first one being where you have a grid connection only and you have no solar. Now I would see that the kinds of households sort of five or ten years from now that are in that camp are probably ones without available roof supply, uh, roof space, so they might be how, um, apartment buildings. The second example is one where you've got both solar and a grid connection. That could start to become quite expensive depending on the way in which networks are charged. 
The third one is where you've got solar storage and, and basically you might just use the grid for that odd day or the odd peak day in the year when you might not have sufficient sto um, solar and storage backup. And then households that go completely off grid. So I think when I think about what are the big issues, I'm sorry, um, in terms of solar and storage, I forgot I had this slide obviously, um, battery storage is actually approaching viability. Now there's lots of different debates about how quickly and when and Tesla built a huge factory and that's going to bring down the prices. When I talk to people in the US about battery storage technology, if you think about it at the household level rather than at power station level, the main thing in a lithium-ion battery that, you know, the technology and when people start investing in it is mobile phone batteries. So all along they've been trying to make mobile phone batteries smaller and now we're at a point where we actually want them to last longer. I don't know if you guys remember when you'd have a mobile phone and you'd only have to charge it every few days, but now you have to charge it obviously every single day because apps and, and all the sorts of things that are coming with our iPhones are really starting to drain battery life. So the technology and the investment is actually suddenly starting to swing back around into how do we make these batteries last longer? And I, I believe, and, and certainly um, there's a number of people at the EPRI, um, at EPRI in the US who also believe this, that will actually start to drive the type of innovation that you need to see to actually see battery cost and durability at the household level um, improve. So, you know, whether it's five years away or ten years away is, is a big debate and, you know, it's a big call and I'm, I don't think I'd want to make that today, but I think it is coming and I think there will be a number of households in Australia and that's 30% of our um, electricity use in this country who will find themselves off-grid or at least for a large part, a por portion of their um, electricity use off-grid and that has implications obviously for the business model in the company that I work for, um, but also for all of us as participants in, in society. So when I think about what are the challenges for energy policy going forward and for the, the green paper and the white paper when it comes, I think it's not about what's the next big bit of investment or the next big bit of kit we're going to invest in to um, you know, meet our future energy needs. I actually think it's about understanding the decline in energy demand. Because if you do take that household sector out of it, and I do think the decline in the household sector will outrun any growth in population and new connections, then where is the industrial growth coming from? You know, we could talk about potentially having a lower Australian dollar, but the smelters have always been fairly vulnerable. We've seen the closure of the Point Henry um, aluminium smelter here this year. There's been talk about um, what the outlook for Portland or um, Tomago might be. So from my perspective, it's hard to see where you get these huge amounts of growth um, coming from in the, in the industrial sector. That d the debate about the RET at the moment, I've said it's a furphy, not because it's not important, because it is important but really because no new investment is needed or is likely to occur, and I'm talking about in large scale renewable energy or large scale energy more broadly, because um, the commercial drivers just aren't there. Even if you get the RET policy sorted out, you've got an oversupplied wholesale market and what we would call a really low black price. So even if you combine a healthy RET price with an unhealthy black energy price, it still doesn't add up to the cost of investing in new renewables. So for me, there's two key challenges facing policymakers given there's falling demand. The first one is how do we sustainably transform our sector to ensure we get a lower emissions footprint? So we need to understand what's the scale of the challenge that we want for our sector. We need to get, understand better what the oversupply challenge is and the market design that's needed to actually make sure we can address that going forward. And then who's going to pay for the grid? So is it something that we pay for as just consumers? Is it almost like essentially a land tax? Or is it something where we say if you're, connect, if you're connected you pay for it? Or is it something we say you only actually pay for it if you're using the grid um, at a certain amount each year? Because those kinds of questions are really going to matter to how the system itself evolves going forward. 